Welcome everyone. The topic for tonight is building your new family on distinctively Christian principles. We all have some exposure to the world's principles about marriage. In fact, we may find that distressingly, a fair bit of those principles are part of our own lives. Okay, and we're trying to get rid of that. We're trying to refocus on, on how Jesus would recommend that we live our lives, how Jesus would recommend that we build our families. You can find actually like six hours of marriage retreat content that we presented on our Deep Waters 205 YouTube channel. If you're interested, I strongly recommend it. I think it was, it was a great marriage retreat, tons of great stuff. It may share some slides with what you're gonna see tonight, but it goes into it deeper and I, I strongly encourage you. We're just gonna say that every marriage cl class or talk we do begins with this slide. This is how we look at Christian marriage. That Christian marriage is learning to live as one and learning to live as one has these three layers. It means growing as friends, it's growing as partners, and it's growing as lovers. Okay, so for more information, check out our marriage retreat there on YouTube. It is important that people understand that the three-layer pyramid actually has a subterranean layer, a layer zero. That it's assumed whenever you see the three layers, that there's a foundation beneath the foundation, uh, and that is being great disciples together. Okay, all this is preliminary. I haven't even gotten into the material. We're just laying the, laying the, uh, the intro here. What, what does it mean that we're going to build our, our marriages on Christian principles? Well, a.k.a. that's the Bible. <laughs> okay? So I wanted to give you three different categories of fantastic verses to write on your heart. So there's lots of opportunity for, for you know, extra credit, additional learning. By the way, you can all gain access to this, uh, this presentation, but feel free to take, take pictures. Right, the five great scriptures on marriage. You never, you never knew there were five great scriptures on marriage in the scriptures, did you? Well, there are, according, according to me and Susan. These are the five great ones, the ones that, that, that wrap it up most succinctly and, uh, and deeply. What about the six great scriptures on parenting? Okay, you didn't know that there were six great scriptures on parenting, did you? What about the 58 one another scriptures? And depending on how you count, there could be a few more or a few less. But, but there are 58 one another scriptures, and those things teach us how to be good to people. And uh, your wife or husband is one such person, and those things will apply. Okay? So let's dig into Ephesians chapter 5. And we went over it on Sunday. Jordan gave a great message. I, I thought it was outstanding. And uh, he talked about a submission and sacrifice. Let, let's just read this. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to yourself, uh, submit yourselves to your husband, to your own husbands, as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Let me just say that submit seems to cause our eyes to just focus on that word. So let me ask you, which is easier to be the church that receives untold blessings upon blessing from Jesus for simply submitting to his will, or to be Jesus who is nailed to a cross, tortured and, and crucified uh, for the sake of the church? So this really isn't such an imbalanced verse as some people might think. Mm -hmm. Which would you rather be, the one who lays down his life for the other or the one who says, I love that, I'm all in. Uh, these things aren't intended, this is Susan's and my uh, interpretation to you, these things aren't intended to bind people 
in dysfunctional relationships. These things are descriptions of what the ideal relationship looks like. When both sides are firing on, on all cylinders, right, you have a situation where it's easy to submit to someone who is truly trustworthy, who's truly sacrificial. And in fact, the leadership that is ascribed to men in this passage, to husbands, I don't think of and we don't think of in terms of the men are the ones who call the shots and make all the decisions. It's the men are the ones who are responsible for the spiritual success of the family. And that's what Jesus was. And he was admirable and we love him for it. And that's what godly uh, marriages can be. Oh, by the way, the, um, the model that's put forward here is, uh, is that of a body, okay? So uh, the husbands and wives, they're different parts, but in some way they're, they're like one body. Hmm. So your, your right hand doesn't get mad at your left hand. Your eye doesn't get mad at your foot. It, it, your, your, your knee doesn't blame your shoulder. It doesn't compete with your shoulder. No, a, a body works together and there's only collective success is the only definition of success. So we introduce men and women are different. Husband and wives have the same value, but different roles. Okay? They are in a partnership that requires both. Love and sacrifice, respect and submission, We've talked about these things. Uh, the, this describes the ideal relationship when both are doing their part. But okay, that's, that's the, the theoretical level. Who actually does what? That's another level. By the way, you see I'm, I'm keying off the topics that you identified you were interested in hearing about. Yeah. But who actually does what? Well, the way that Susan and I look at it, the husband is responsible for everything. So whatever the husband and the wife do is done by delegation and agreement, right? The, the, so the husband's responsible for everything, and according to their gifts, the, these are four great criteria for who should do a certain task. Who's gifted for it? Who's available to do it? Who's interested in doing it? And who's opinionated about the outcome? Okay, so um, this is just for us when we were newly married. I wasn't working for about a year and a half, and um, so I dealt with everything. I did all the bills, I took care of the cars, I took care of the cleaning, I took care of the shopping, I took care of the taxes, I did everything. And then when children started to come, we could no, I could no longer do all that. <laughs> so. I started to delegate, but it definitely... You mean uh, we rediscussed, we the, rediscussed the, the allocation yes. of tasks? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like, it probably happened over a tearful session. With a <laughs> oh, she's delegating back to me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, and, you know, it's interesting, but what if you run into something that you both hate? Like, mm -hmm. you both hate cleaning or you both hate laundry, or you both hate cooking, you both hate paying bills, whatever it is. Bills. Yeah, <laughs> so. Just don't pay bills. <laughs> <laughs> <It's so, laughs> but, you know, that, that's a problem where you, you know, obviously those things, whatever it is, it needs to be done. So then you might figure out who hates at least, <laughs> or it might be, you know, it's still neat. This is something we're going to have to do together because we both dislike it. So let's do it together. Or it could be, I mean, Steve doesn't enjoy paying bills. Um, and, so and do you enjoy paying bills? I, no, I detest it. Okay. But I, I so, do. I, so I've done it ever since she, was, she got pregnant. Yeah, but I will. There are a few bills that I take care of. But, you know, sometimes he'll say, you know, these bills are really overdue. Will you come sit with me and help me get it done? And, you know, we've all had a project that we just could never manage and you needed just reinforcements or moral support. So mm -hmm. there are times for that. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's 
uh, th that, that does help you to get through it. And you know the, the part where it says their opinions over the outcome. You know, it's a running joke in my family. No matter who cleans up the kitchen, I'm going to go behind you and I'm going to rearrange the dishwasher. <laughs> get everything in it that didn't fit. But so, you know, and it, it's, you know, nobody's offended by that. I, I have, care more about it than someone. So it, it's okay if you do stuff like that. I mean, you've got to talk about it. But if, if you are offended, then that's something else to work out. And let me add, we also have a rule that uh, the person who's on the hook to do a task gets the more say about how it's done. Right. So, and, hence... Yeah, we worked that out when I was micromanaging his dishwashing, and he said, would you like to do it and take over? And, you know, sometimes it might be yes, <laughs> and sometimes it's like, okay, that's my signal that I need to let it go, and no, you're you're fine to take care of it, and I walk away. If, I, if I'm micromanaging too much, I need to walk away. <laughs> but um, that, uh, let me think. And I really appreciate the husband being responsible for everything. Just, I mean, that's a lot of responsibility. A lot is delegated, but as the leader of the house, you know, just like an organization, the CEO is responsible for everything. Now he delegates to the people he's hired to work under him, but um, it's, it's ultimately his responsibility. I, I appreciate that. And this frees you up to realize the gifts that are in your marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Who's the more gifted one in a certain thing? Have them do that. So Ephesians 5 just keeps on rolling. <laughs> it doesn't hold back. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we're members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Let me just touch on this, that Paul here is quoting from Genesis 2. Okay, so in the beginning, right, at the beginning of mankind, where it's talking about the creation of man and the intent of God for man, um, it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So this notion of out of two making one, this is in fact the simple description of what Christian marriage is. Christian marriage is a reality, a spiritual reality which God has brought about that we now learn to live out by learning to live as one. So we've been made one, but now we need to learn to live as one. Okay, in unity, in teamwork, uh, in, in love, I mean, in forgiveness, all that stuff. We're learning to live as one. And furthermore, it... it it brings out right here uh, from Genesis 2 th this, this principle uh, that husband and wife leave their families and become a new family. Leave their father and mother and they're united to their wife and the two will become one flesh. And by the way, that, that verse is quoted by Jesus. So it's not only in Genesis 2, it's in like Matthew 19 or something like that, where Jesus quotes it to, to make a lesson, and then Paul used it there in Ephesians 5. He uses it another place, I think in 1 Corinthians 6, where he's, he's using it to, for another point. So that's a really important hinge passage, a uh, very important passage. So let's talk about uh, two themes that you had identified, okay? Growing together and relationships with in-laws that... that pop out from this verse. Growing together. Growing in married life is learning to live as one. We mentioned that. You act as one body, though you are multiple parts. You're partners. You're a team. No blaming, no competing. The strengths of one are the strengths of the whole. Same for weaknesses. 
The only measure of success is collective success. In marriage, there are many opportunities to grow spiritually as we grow closer to each other as friends, as partners, and as lovers, and thereby closer to God. Now let's talk about relationships with in-laws. Just a few things. It's really important that you protect the independence of your new nuclear family. When one partner or the other gives too much control away from the new family, back to their, their family of their youth and birth, uh, then that complicates things. That tears things apart, it tears things down. So protect the independence of your new nuclear family. And you understand what I mean by nuclear family, okay? It's not like you're a nuclear bomb. Uh, some people need to be protected from the family of their youth. So, so this, is, this is one thing in terms of relationships with in-laws. Some people come from very dysfunctional households. And there might have been abuse, there might have been dysfunction of any... And, and they need to be protected, okay? But everyone feels loved when their spouse loves their family. Whether you need to protect them from them a little bit or whether you need to fully, you know, fully embrace them in terms of activities and so forth. Uh, Susan. Okay. So this is, this is a big, um, this can be a big source of tension or a lot to figure out because you're separating from your parents who have always influenced you. You're separating from your siblings in many ways, and you're now making this person your spouse, your greatest priority. And it's, it, it can just be challenging. And the ways that you protect your spouse, you know, sometimes they can be very subtle. And I can remember when, like the first Christmas with Steve's family, it, well, most visits, as much as I love my in-laws, most visits to his family, they were in California, when we went, we would, he was, they, they were in California. And most of the times when we went, we'd go for at least a week. And there would be one or two times where I'm crying in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. And they were lovely people. Mm -hmm. And we were lovely people, but it was still just hard. <laughs> and um, there, you know, just even... Um, I can remember one time, like, Steve's parents were 10 years old, older than my parents, and, you know, we were in, in our guest room, and it, um, you know, there was, it just wasn't that clean. And so we were struck, Steve, I was like, I can't take it anymore, we've got to clean this room. And, and we... Wait, uh, that was you, right? That was me. Yeah. I couldn't take it. <laughs> Steve, Steve didn't notice, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I just learned, and I learned, you know, his parents a lot older. When my parents got about that age, I started realizing, you know, they just don't see as well. They don't have the energy. So, you know, it's just okay. And so we learned the ways to discreetly clean, or I'd take over or something when we got there in a good way. And his mom, I wasn't taking power away from her. She was happy to do whatever. So um, she would pack cleaning supplies, yeah. and and when she landed, she'd break them out and clean the room as job number one. <laughs> <laughs> so and I tried to be. I was not in there muttering like this is disgusting. How do you live there? Never, you know, a million years would say anything like that. But you know, there are just some things that would make the visit easier. Mm -hmm. And so we we did that, and you know, I would take over washing dishes at night because. Mm -hmm. I liked hot water. They liked tepid water. <laughs> so, with, all, with all the family in support. Yeah, yes. yes. So it was, you know, just just normal, you know, just stuff you had to adjust to. But um, anyway, it, it, but I really appreciated that Steve knew my need and he didn't say, honey, just, just be quiet. Just deal with it. You, we can't make waves. He, it was never that. He knew what I needed and he, we figure out a way to meet that need without making, you know, big waves or something. And just, you know, over time, as you get to know your families, you adjust. And I remember, like, the first Christmas, we, um, I cried Christmas Eve because we ate 
rice and beans on faded plastic plates on a plastic tablecloth, and there was no china, there was no linens, there was no Christmas dish, you know, it was just, and, you know, as his mom got, you know, as I, I got to know him, I found like, oh, there's, there are Christmas plates, and I would get them out, but she was so tired and older, she didn't, one year she said, oh, I some Christmas plates somewhere, and we dug them out, and we used them every year. And she loved that and about she you. Loved that. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, and it made it it's special. We found the nice tablecloth, and we did, you know. But it was, you know, it we worked it worked out through the years. Up there, it says that we're partners, and a phrase that we use is that we're a good team. And this so often. Yes, and it it will be when you come to, you know, one another's rescue a lot of times because maybe I've dropped the ball on something and Steve comes in and we may figure it out and and um, put it together, and and then there's you, not the berating like why can't you do this or wow you really messed that up but it's like, you know I might be saying thank you for helping me and he's like we're a good team. And it's, you know, the strengths, you know, if the batter strikes out, then maybe the next one gets a home run and they're just a good team together. So, you know, finding out those things that make y'all good teams and helping each other and not... And she does the same for me. Yes. So that works out well. Rather than getting angry at each other's weaknesses, just, you know, we're a good team. We'll figure this out. Conflict resolution. We literally have one slide and just a few things in, on an enormous topic. Let me, let me just say that we, we couldn't get through all that great stuff and not just touch on conflict resolution. So conflict resolution begins with a shared standard. Okay? And we are the most fortunate people in all the earth to have such a rich, shared standard, right, as the bedrock for our marriage. Uh, touching on some, some great passages here, Ephesians 4, 26 to 27, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Okay, we've heard that before. Matthew 7, verses 3 to 5, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And, and this is a passage where Jesus is talking about how people so, so want to correct the other person. But his, his guidance to us is always look first to yourself. And even if it is, even if your failing is tiny compared to their failing, make that a habit, make that a pattern. You look to yourself first. You sort out what you did wrong, what you could have done better, right? What you said inappropriately. So first take the plank out of your own eye. And he just assumes the one in your eye is the bigger one. Okay, that's just his assumption. Um, And then Colossians 3.13, forgive as the Lord forgave you. You know, in conflict resolution, there's the emotional part, and then there's actually rolling up your sleeves and coming up with a plan for, for how you're going to resolve what, what you have a conflict over. And this inevitably is going to involve compromise. And I will say on that, there have been times after the start over, after the apologies, after the reset, maybe the next day I've come back and said, you know, I'm still feeling some things from the, from yesterday. Can we talk about those? Mm -hmm. And it's, but the, the emotional, it's been diffused, but there may still be some lingering hurts or some lingering thoughts that you need to talk about, and that's okay. Yeah, First Corinthians 13 talks about keeping no record of wrongs. Well, if you didn't get to express what you're feeling sufficiently, you may feel like, I've got more to say. I can't <laughs> let go of that yet. Well, and particularly if someone's a late processor, like, okay. <laughs> we've, yeah, we've, you know, resolved things before the sun went down, but wait a minute, you know, I'm still thinking about this, you know, however longer, 
it takes you, but that it's okay to go back. Yeah. I mean, you may have talked through it and you you're resolved, but you need more input through it or it's I don't know if it like if it's something that keeps reoccurring or supposing someone made a big a big mistake that's going to impact you for a long time like maybe a car accident where they were at fault and now you're you're there's a lot of money that has to be paid or I, I don't know but it there are some some things that you might need more help like you're you're at peace with one another, but you're you're not resolved in many ways, and you've got to talk through some more things. It's not always a matter of identifying what's right and what's wrong, and both parties agreeing perfectly with that. If, but you, you've heard the um, the approach of when you did this, it made me feel that, mm -hmm. right? It's not an accusation. You're in fact sharing your feelings. Mm. And I'm sure that your spouse would, would care deeply if you feel bad as a result of something that came about by something he could have mm. done differently. Mm. So maybe think about those in that way, that it's a good thing to share your feelings because that's the genuine you. And that's about, about learning to live as one. Do your best to resolve things quickly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to sleep on it. Sometimes you need to let the adrenaline subside. Right. <laughs> and sometimes someone's got um, an import, important work to do late into the night. And then they're getting up early in the morning. And it, it's just not possible. So... This is just a, a, a bit of biblical wisdom, okay? It's not a rule or a, or a, a, a magic promise yeah. that if you do this, then magic happens, and if you don't do it exactly, it's, it's just a bit of biblical wisdom. It's, it's very similar to the conflict you have on the way to church. <laughs> if you pull in, <laughs> it's like... I take communion, you know, no, but yeah. it, it's just like, you know what, and acknowledging the tension, like, honey, I'm sorry we've had this conflict, mm -hmm. I just, can we just let this rest and, and get this mm -hmm. result, like, can we talk about it later, so, yeah. and, and you, you come back together, you're emotionally connected, mm -hmm. and, but you still, and so you can go about your day or you can get your sleep or whatever, and then you'll resolve it. And please know that I love you. Yes. But we have to resolve it. Resolve this. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it again this evening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on to a, an interesting topic. Let's talk about whether to have children and when and how many. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, so this is a good topic. Um, <laughs> Let's. We're we're in a we're in a group of uh, of young marrieds without children. Okay, so uh, the the first thing that's really important is not to carry around worldly perspectives on children and family. Okay, here here are some that I I picked out. You may recognize them. Okay, just from the culture, from what things you felt or seen or you know heard on social media or whatever. Uh, I can do more good with my career than having a family. Living my best life means not being tied down by children. No. <laughs> What's that? I said you felt them. <laughs> oh, there's so much evil in the world. I can't bring a child into it. You know how Jesus feels about that? You know, got, well, well, we'll see in a moment. Yeah. Um, because you are the light of the world. You, we, all of God's children are the light of the world. And, uh, okay, uh, I'm not there yet. Yeah, yeah. Children and people in general are bad for the planet. <laughs> we need fewer of them. That's out there. Raising a family is too hard, and I might fail. So if you feel attached to any of these, 
Maybe, maybe you didn't even know that you felt attached to any of these. If you feel attached to them, just pray about it, talk about it, meditate on it. But I think all these things are things that, that, that would probably be release for growing children of God. Okay? Here's some spiritual perspectives on children and family. In Genesis 1, where God is, is where, where, where Genesis lays out God's intentions for the world, right? His hopes and dreams for the world, right? God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Okay? Uh, here in Proverbs, one, uh, sorry, Psalm 127, children are a heritage from the Lord. And some translations say children are a blessing from the Lord. Offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. And then two thoughts just to, to, to meditate on. God is a father. Mm-hmm. Is, is his role as a parent something that's worth imitating? Something that's worth embracing? Uh, Christian families are a light to the world. Okay? So those are some things to, to think about, to meditate on. Um, now, let, let me just say, before I go any further, uh, um, I, it's, it's super important that we honor one another's decisions, okay? This is not in any way uh, a, a discussion which would want to dishonor anyone's decisions. Because frankly, no two people are alike. No two couples are exactly alike. You have different life situations. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's good that we honor one another's decisions. I'm just talking about this because it's a relevant topic, right? right? And it's good to have those ideas that are good to think about. So consider your marriage, okay? Uh, marriage is difficult, isn't it? <laughs> but let me ask you, has it been worth it? Yes. 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 Difficult, yes. Worth it? Oh, so worth it. <laughs> Your spouse is the most important person in the world to you. The most important. Your marriage is the most important project you will ever undertake. And there are some lessons in life you will never learn unless you get married and persevere with it. Now, we love our single friends. And they're awesome. They're, Jesus was single. Paul may have been single, okay? Jesus, we're, we're really highly confident he was single. Um, so, so there's nothing unspiritual about being single. But to my, my single friends who are interested in my thoughts and my advice, you know what? There are so many spiritual lessons and so much spiritual maturity that you just will not have the opportunities for growth that your married brothers and sisters do. Mm-hmm. I mean, our marriage is chock full of opportunities to grow. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, well, given that we've, you know, I think we're, we're probably pretty uniform on this in this room. Yeah, we, we totally relate to this. Hmm, similarly, parenting is difficult. Mm-hmm but so worth it. Those little munchkins. They're so adorable. (laughs) Your children, your children are the second most important people in the world to you. Okay? Who's the first? Your spouse. Okay, so this is saying nothing bad about children. Those children are way up there. Your children are the second most important uh, people in the world to you, your family is the second most important project you will ever undertake. It's just a bigger, a bigger form of, of the first project, which is your, your marriage. Uh, there are some lessons in life you will never learn unless you have children and persevere with it. I remember saying 
when I was single, yeah, I'm a really patient man. I'm, I'm really growing in this. This is, this is one of my strengths. And then I got married and I realized, whoa, I need to, this is something I need to work on. And then I had children and I realized it was a weakness. <laughs> Those situations served up innumerable opportunities for growth. Our advice on having children, now this is general advice, okay? Not tailored to any particular person. But if, if someone came up and said, what are your thoughts on, on having children? We honor everyone for their decisions to get married or not, to have children or not. However, these decisions should be made spiritually, not for worldly reasons. Makes sense, right? So uh, our general advice is this. Wait a few years to enjoy your spouse. The period you're in is so wonderful and so valuable. Mm -hmm. And no one is an expert on when, you know, that might, that should come to an end, okay? <laughs> Except you. So we honor one another in our decisions. Spend time with your spouse. That's, that's amazing. Then try to have children. I think about a couple of years, okay? Pe but pe different people in different situations. Some people may want to get on with it. Some people may want to, it, it, it's, it really is your decision. I'm just bringing these issues up. But after a while, uh, every year you wait is a year you will miss from enjoying them in adulthood and enjoying your grandchildren, right? So that's just something to think about. I mean, Susan and I got married late-ish, 30 mm -hmm. and 33. Um, you know, my, my parents were 40 when I was, when I was born. So fortunately they got to see their three grandchildren who are our three children. Um, but they didn't get to see them grow to maturity and that would have been cool. Um, and you'll never regret having two to four children. So you can have one child. That's your choice. That's your choice. It's fun, Brett. No, no, no. I'm just. I, I know. I know that the the prevailing the prevailing culture would say minimum one or two. It's so hard. It's so painful. It's so. Yeah, you don't want to be outnumbered. But let me tell you, every single one of those children is a, a total blessing. It's a total blessing. And if you have one by surprise at some point, or maybe two, then, um, you know, d down the line, you just think, I, I can't imagine life without these, these additional one or two. And, and by the way, if you're worried about the planet, right, we're in a demographic time bomb. Because women are not having an average of two children per woman. <clears throat> And the, the U.S. is in a modest time bomb. There are other areas of the world that are in a gigantic time bomb. And their society, as they currently understand it, will dramatically change for the worse in 30 years. Because Maybe. people are not having kids? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. people are not having kids. Anyway, it's, it's a growth opportunity, I promise you. And you will be a richer, fuller, more Christ-like, more godly person through that process.